Hey, we're back again. This is Pastor Ernie, and I'm with uh, Pastor Randy Upgren, and we're with the awesome, the famous Tim Pesky, and we're again in the office right here um, on a podcast uh, with so much uncertainty in the world, um, lots of questions, uh, lots of fear, and we are just here as a voice to hopefully bring peace and joy and love to you all and a calm sense of Jesus is in charge. And today, uh, we are we are coming from a book that Pastor Randy Epkren has written called The End is the Beginning. It's betting your life on the ultimate second chance. And, and Randy, you wrote this book how long ago? Uh, it was 2016, summer of 2016. Yep, in 2016, he locked himself into a room for like two or three weeks, practiced social distancing, and, uh, and came out with this. Uh, I'm really digging this book. Um, I'd call it a masterpiece, maybe because I like you, Randy. Yeah, I think you're biased. But maybe yeah. I'm biased. Yeah. But uh, we are going to talk about today some subjects that's going to be very important to you. And I think you will learn and grow through this, and I think you will find more peace in it. We're going to talk about weathering storms, but we're also going to talk about something called anonymity. anonymity. And the story of Noah. And the story, the story of, Noah. of Noah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and uh, so you had some Bible verses, Ernie, that you were sharing with us earlier. Why don't we start by uh, sharing some of those verses with our friends? Yeah, I did. And these will come into play uh much later, and, and it's always on where shall we remain anonymous? Where should we, where should we come out and actually speak? And in a time like this, all of us are in the place of, of what do we do now and what don't we do now? And those are just weighing against each other because we've never been in this space before. And we look, we look in the Word where it was appropriate sometimes to stay anonymous, Jesus himself, in many places, he he became lost in the crowd when key people were looking for him, and he wanted to remain anonymous. He told his mom at one time, "Shh, don't say anything." I actually, he told multiple people that a lot early people. on in his ministry. Yep. you know, don't tell yes. anybody I did this because it wasn't his yes. time yet to emerge. I'd rather stay anonymous in this, and then sometimes, uh, sometimes he was out there saying, basically, "I am the Messiah." And he knew the difference in when to stay anonymous and when to put that anonymity aside and let the light shine. And so in Luke chapter 19, 39 and 40, it says, Some Pharisees told Jesus to silence his disciples, make them stay anonymous. But here's what Jesus said. He says, I could do that, but, and this is a paraphrase, if I do that, the very rocks that are around us will cry out. Now that's energy is what it is. Jeremiah 20 verse 9 is, an, is very insightful. It says this, and here's what Jeremiah said, and I can feel this inside when I read this. But if I say, I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name. His word in my heart is like a fire shut up in my bones. He says, I am weary of holding on to it. He said, indeed, I cannot keep it to myself. Uh, the redemptive qualities of God, um, I think we'd all agree, cannot be hidden. They do not serve uh, anonymity very well. The virus does not serve anonymity very well when it comes to bringing hope and joy and love and peace to our, so, to our neighbors. And so we're going to open this conversation in a second. And so I'd like you all just to bow your heads with us. And then we're going to pass this over to Pastor Randy, who's going to tell us what he was thinking when he read this, when he wrote this book. And then we're going to discuss it, and hopefully it helps you. Dear Heavenly Father, as I speak through these airways right now, we're, we're mighty happy that we have these airways to talk to people over and to connect socially through the airways, Lord, when we cannot connect personally. God, we need you to do in our world things we can't do for ourselves. We look around and see so much uncertainty, so many questions, so many question marks. But when it comes to you, God, there's no question marks. You who says, I am who I am, you remain firm. That's a foundation we can all, uh, we can all rely upon in days like this. 
As we talk about weathering storms, God, and when to be anonymous and when not to, I just pray you will guide our conversation in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yeah, thank you, Ernie. So um, chapter two, or three, it would be chapter three of this book, The End of Anonymity, it follows this or continues to follow this theme of uh, the end is the beginning. And we look at the life of Noah and how that theme plays out in the life of Noah, uh, this very interesting character. And so we, we look at anonymity and we say, well, anonymity is, can be a good thing or a bad thing. It's what we call an instrumental. Yes. It's, yes. it's an instrumental entity, meaning it can be either good or bad, depending on how it's used. It's often used in bad ways. We see that on social media. People hide behind a certain amount of anonymity and, and use that to lash out at others, be uncivil, be rude, um, or even kind of violent in certain ways. Um, you see anonymity is a bad thing when we see how, for example, um, sexual predators have underground groups on the dark web and then they encourage each other oh, yes. and they help each other. Uh, but anonymity can also be positive at times. Sometimes it's good for somebody who's struggling, say, with an addiction, and, and they need the anonymity of, a, of an AA group, for example, to help work their, their stuff out. Um, sometimes anonymity can be a, a good thing. And sometimes anonymity is neutral, and sometimes we like to be neutral, meaning we like to blend in. I think Noah, probably, uh, we don't know personality what he was like, but we get the sense that Noah was rather anonymous up until the point that God calls him to essentially build an aircraft carrier in his driveway. In the desert. Right? And here he is. He, it, it, the world is, has gotten just breathtakingly evil. Okay, the, tell us how breathtakingly well, well, because this is staggering. Yeah, well, the scripture is doesn't, you know, mince anything about it. It says that the world had become, or mankind had become, only evil all the time. Only evil all the time. Chapter 6 of Genesis. And, I mean, so there's no gray in this. That, that God has passed judgment that, that humanity, with the exception of Noah, was only evil all the time. But Noah, it said, walked with God. Now, that doesn't mean Noah was perfect. It just means that Noah had a relationship with God that still had integrity, that he was humble before God, that he walked with God, that he understood his need for forgiveness and guidance from God. He was the only one, he and his family. And God calls him, like we said, to build this monstrosity as a, not, a, not just as a, um, a cradle, not just as something, uh, a boat of salvation for he and his family, but we have to remember that this served as a testimony to God's judgment for at least somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 to 100 years to his neighbors while he was building it. You don't hide that kind no. of a thing. He no. wasn't hiding that under a tent or under you know the trees in his backyard. He's, Noah's boat was 437.6 feet long, okay. 72.11 feet high, and 43.9 feet wide. So basically wow. the size of a football field. Yes. A little longer than a, longer football, than a field, football field, not quite as wide, but but pretty wide. And yeah, I mean, this is a massive, massive structure, and God is calling him to to do this. And we have to we have to think about you know some key things that are going on. He is no longer given the option to be anonymous, and as the world gets darker and more chaotic and more uncertain, I think that. Perhaps the lesson for all of us is we don't we're not given the option to be anonymous. Now, social isolation, as we've all been practicing, is not the same as being anonymous. No, it isn't. That's not the same thing. And 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 so I think we want to talk a little bit about what that means to us today. Noah has he cannot hide anymore. He has to follow you know this command of God, and it's going to become very public. Um, it's not always easy, is it, Tim, to, to do this? No, and I think of, um, you know, I work with a lot of volunteers around here, and we're always going, how do we get more volunteers? How do we get more volunteers? And I know there's people sitting in our congregation that show up every Sunday, every Wednesday, who have amazing skills, but they'd rather, oh, they, I'm not as good of a singer. I'm not going to say I can sing on the team. I, I, I couldn't be as good of an usher. I can't be a good of a whatever it is, and they're in yeah. love with being anonymous, and they're not 
joining a ministry because I'd rather be anonymous because if I do something and I make a mistake, people are going to see me. Right. Yeah. You right. Know, we see that all the time and getting volunteers because they want to stay anonymous, I think, is one of those times where it's like, man, I really wish people wouldn't want to be anonymous. Flip the coin. We've got volunteers who are crazy involved that want to stay anonymous because they get it. It's not about me, the volunteer. It's about the bigger picture of serving Jesus. Absolutely. Interesting. So we find ourselves in times like this where so much of what we used to control, we kind of don't control, which requires us to, to, to kind of pivot a little bit in our lives. But then the question comes, how do we, how do, we do that and not slide into sort of this compliant anonymity um, make sure that, like you were talking, Tim, earlier about um, are we maybe being shy about talking to people about Jesus in, in ways that uh, we shouldn't be uh, at times like this? Because it is during these times when people are most open to spiritual yep. conversations. The Apostle Paul would say a mighty door of opportunity is open to all of us. And it, how easy of a time right now is it to share? All you have to do is literally hit the share button yeah. to the podcast, to the worship service, to the whatever it is, even if it's not ours. Hey, you find a really great uh, sermon from Podunk, Minnesota that was really great. Share it because people can either go, oh, I don't want to watch that. Or maybe just maybe one person watches it and their life changes because you hit share. Right. So one of the things we have to understand is that if we are going to uh, find ways, whatever creative ways they are, to share the gospel with people, to share Christ with people, we are going to encounter resistance. We are going to encounter rainstorms and wind and lightning and thunder and all the things that go with storms. Uh, God is not going to steer us away from storms. He will sometimes be with us as the storms kind of surround us. That's part of what happens. Uh, one of the th there, there are a couple of theological points about the story of Noah that I think need to be pointed out that I make the effort to do in this chapter. And the first one is, is people often want to say, how could God just pass judgment on the earth just like that? Just boom. Only evil all the time. Yeah, but really, seriously, what about the children? I mean, the children. I mean, the, um, the, how could you say that about the children? Well, I've, not... I've met evil children. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I work in the public school. There are evil children. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> maybe in private schools too. But uh, yeah. uh, but here's the th there, there, there are a couple things about that. Number one, uh, God when He proclaims judgment in Scripture we see that there is always the possibility of repentance within that um, because we see him do it with Jonah and Nineveh, Nineveh for yeah. example. He offers that possibility for Sodom and Gomorrah. And so Noah's building this ark. It takes somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 years or more to build this, and that ark sits there as a testimony to the people. If the people would have seen this and turned, I think it's reasonable to say, based on what we... What else we see in Scripture, God would have relented on this. But, of course, they didn't. Absolutely. And, and, and it's not just 70 years either, by the way. How long did God allow for this to happen yep. uh, in, in the midst of those people? We know that Noah had predecessors that were also considered righteous, righteous Methuselah, for example, and others. There were these people who stood as testimonies to this growing evil um, in humanity. And finally God said, okay, that's, that's it. Um, we, we're going to have to move forward. But the second thing is when we talk about children, and, and, and I get this, I do not want to sound flip when I say this. I really don't. But we, we have to remind ourselves that God sees what we don't see. We see a 10-year-old child, and we say, well, how can that child be guilty but God sees what that child is going to become. We don't. He, 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 you know, there was a time when Adolf Hitler was a 10-year-old boy. And, and so he, when he passes judgment in situations like this and in later situations, God sees what we don't see. He sees the trajectory of where this is and who these people are and where, where it's going. We see yep. that later when the Hebrews take the land from the Amorites. Um, so we have to keep those two things in mind. God is incredibly gracious. We see that continuously 
um, throughout the uh, the Old Testament. Randy, you say something here very interesting. You say a common misunderstanding involves the idea that God used the flood to deal with the presence of sin in the world. You called that an oversimplification. Oversim- you said in this this book that in the flood God deals uh, dramatically with uh, with evil in order that He might deal patiently with sin. Tell us what you mean by that. Yeah, so. We have to understand that evil is symptomatic of sin. Because we are tainted with original sin, the evil that we do is just like the symptoms of that disease. Yeah. And in this case, the evil, as it was being expressed by humanity, only evil all the time, was so overwhelming that in order for God to deal patiently with the sin issue, he needed to basically stabilize the creation again. Yeah. And the flood was his way of stabilizing the creation. And we know this because Noah clearly wasn't sinless. On the other side of the flood, yeah. we see him. He gets drunk. He's lying naked in his tent. And there's a, there are issues between him and his sons. And So these are not sinless people. God is dealing with sin in Christ in a much longer term and much more permanent and much more uh, long, uh, obviously, uh, uh, thorough way. But he has to restrain evil first yes. in order to allow the development of his people and allow the story of the Messiah to develop. It, it's like triage in a hospital during a crisis situation. You have to go through all the patients and you have to decide this person's really critical. This person can wait three hours. This, you know what I mean? And, and, or in addiction recovery, as you guys would understand, um, you, have to sometime, you have to dry out the, the, the alcoholic first. Right. Because if you just if they if, if they continue to just drink but then go to group, it's not necessarily in at least in many cases it's not going to be that effective. They they need to quit drinking a lot of times or or at least start that process. Now I'm not saying that every time it happens that way, but it often happens that way. Um, and so that's what it is. The, it, I write here: the world's environment was simply too evil, too corrupt, and too violent for a long-term and permanent solution for sin to take root. And so with the flood, God stabilized his creation and prepped it for the long-term healing. Absolutely. That's what's going on here. Absolutely. I want to ask Tim this um, specifically. Uh, Randy puts in his book that when God calls you, as he did Noah, quiet anonymity is no longer an option. Do you believe in that? Or do, you, do you believe that? Quiet anonymity is no longer an option. Yeah, that we have an option to stay anonymous. There's lots of people that... With their faith, they say, you won't see much of an expression of my faith because I live a quiet right. faith. Or we say it's personal. Yeah. It's personal, yeah. It's, it's, Which, or private, maybe, is a better yeah. way to well, it. Well, ironically, our saying this year for Ignite is it's personal. Um, but we don't mean it that we, way. Right, and we actually had a guy who was kind of offended by that, and I said, well, yeah, it's, it's personal because God takes this whole thing and brings it down to just Ernie and brings it down to just Randy and Tim. Um, what I was kind of struck by as we were talking here, um, cause I'd like to see when God flips the script. Um, and maybe I'm, I'm wrong here, guys, you guys are the pastors tell me, but he, God wipes out all people to save one man in Noah. And then when Jesus, he wipes out one man to save all the people. World. Yeah. Well, and he does, doesn't he? That's and, a really good observation. And, and what if, you know, mm-hmm. Jesus had decided, you know what, I know I'm special, but I, I gotta stay anonymous. Don't, don't tell anybody about me for everything. You know, yeah. you had talked earlier that yeah, there was times when he had to blend into the crowd. I'm sure glad he didn't choose to stay anonymous. Of course, we can always choose. That's that's the great and horrible thing about God yep. is He gave us this freedom to choose because without choice, there's no real true love yep. of God. Right. Um, so of course, there's a choice to stay anonymous, but it's not gonna go well for you if He's yeah. tapped you on the shoulder and said. Go go forth. Just ask all those guys in the scripture how that went for them when they said, "Not me, God." It's, and it's not. No, don't pick me. Well, it's crazy because at the point of salvation, it says He gives us everything that we need for godliness. He He puts inside of us love, and and love is the most powerful thing ever seen. And peace. He gives us joy. He gives us all of those things, and it's contained now inside of us. And maybe that's what Jeremiah meant. It's fire in my bones. I cannot keep this in. But there's also a scary side if we truly surrender to the Lord, isn't there? I think all of us would say that. Because Randy puts in his book, what is God going to ask of us? 
if we truly surrender and we come out of anonymity, as long as we're in anonymity, nobody's going to ask us questions. As long as we don't live out our faith and we live it quietly behind the curtain, I'm going to heaven, but I'm not going to get asked a lot of really hard questions in my life. What well, do you think about the, that? The devil is not afraid of anonymous Christians. I want, to, I want him to be afraid of me, not because of me, but because of Christ in me. When you wake up in the morning... Don't you want the devil to say, oh, my word, yeah, Randy Upgren yeah. is getting out of bed now, or Tim Pesky's out of bed, or Ernie Hockett. You know, and I think that's kind of the call is 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 that. And that doesn't mean that you have to necessarily travel, uh, you know, across the globe and live in, you know, in a hut drinking fermented yak spit and, you know, trying to teach the gospel to ex-cannibals or something like that. It just means... That was a highly specific detail. It was. <laughs> it's, in a, it's in the book. Oh, it's in the book. Yeah, and you can get your copy uh, today. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, no, no. It, I mean, it could, be, it, it could be as simple as, you know, just this niggling that you've had to do something that you have ignored or kept at arm's length, and you've just tried to push it away, and you, you realize that this is God trying to move you to do something. I, I think of some of our volunteers here that think, well, I'm not really doing anything big. But you're changing somebody's life. I think of those ladies that started the quilting club here. And uh, sorry, sis, I'm dropping your name. But she invites people to that thing all the time. Yeah. And she's just thinking, oh, I'm just inviting somebody to go quilting with. No, you're bringing them into our church. You're surrounding with all these other people. Right. And in bringing them into she, an environment of the gospel. Right. right. And in our own way, I think all of us have these little things. You know, we started Inspired Tires. What's the point of that? A bunch of people driving around in fancy cars. No, it's because I want to get to the guy who loves to hang out in cool cars but doesn't want to go to church you right. know, hang out with us we're, we're just we just happen to meet at a church and we just happen to say a prayer occasionally you know right. it's like right. yeah. now we've hooked them you know that's why we do those little things take those those things that god put in your heart that you love doing maybe you love doing photography start a club and you know hey i go to inspire and now you've got people you know through that that's why he puts those things that you love doing that yep. you think is oh that's just my little thing I like to do, how can I use this to serve God? Find a way to take those desires in your heart, to no longer be anonymous and say, hey, let's do this. We've got people bringing yep. puzzles here to share with people. I mean, yep. all this cool stuff that's just hidden around us, you just got to go, how do we find God in that? Okay, so on that, I think we need to shift just a tiny bit because we don't have much time left. There's another part of coming out of anonymity that I don't know if Noah, uh, I don't know if he saw coming. Maybe he did, but probably not in the fury that it came in. Um, we noticed that God called him out. He couldn't be anonymous for those 70, 80 years that he was building the boat. Finally, he got on the boat, and my goodness, was he in for a ride of his life. Um, uh, I say don't hide from the storm, but fight it. But what a rough, stinky mess that had to be for 40 days in a boat with all of those animals. Well, and it was longer than 40 days oh, because yeah. it, it rained or, right. or the waters came for 40 days, and then they had to be in the boat long enough for the waters to recede. So they were in there for quite a long time. What a ride. 480 days. It was quite like a long time, yeah. And and so, you know, he, he, we have to understand that anonymity is is nice and easy and clean. Serving God most of the time isn't. It just isn't. Boy, that's... Well, it's a messy existence, yep. says Phil, or Yacanelli. Right. Right? And messy. Y- yes, it's messy, but it's a beautiful messy. It's a beautiful yeah. kind of messy. And and so I think that um, we have to sort of embrace that kind of thing. Uh, and sometimes it takes strange, interesting you know, turns. I think we need to close here with just some, uh, you know, uh, some takeaways for people, and then I'll close with the last couple cha- uh, paragraphs here of the book. Um, some practical takeaways, you know, like uh, I want to just share with our audience tonight, like, you know, the three of us and my son Josh just spent an hour. We went to the neighborhood and we made these, you know, the hot sheets we do for our normal services, which we don't need right now. We had a new hot sheet, me- hot sheet made for the neighbors. And we, we went and put them on door hangers and we hung them all around the neighborhood, around the church here, just letting our neighbors know, hey, we love you. We know you're there. If you need help, here's our servant group. Go on there. Let us know what your needs are, and our people will meet your needs. Now, I don't know if you actually ran into anybody when you were doing this. I did. One of our neighbors, they called me over, and I explained to them, and they were so grateful, and they were so 
That's really cool, she said. And before people freaked out, we wore gloves. And yes, we, were we very did. very careful. Not we, to... Yes, we were wearing gloves. And, and we made sure yep, everything we, was we, done We took properly, every precaution, so. yep. But they were just so thrilled that we were thinking of them. Uh, little things, right, like that. But there are sometimes when we serve God, the storms come to us. And then sometimes in our own... Um, I don't know what you want to call it, in our own weakness or we're not thinking or whatever, um, we walk into storms that aren't necessary. And so one of the practical takeaways I want to give to people is this, is that as you seek God's will and how you should not be anonymous during this time, I would also ask you to, while you do that, protect your heart and protect your mind because the devil wants to, he wants fear to rule you. He wants fear to drive your behavior, not hope not Christ. Um, and I'm not saying, of course, we should be prudent. Absolutely, we should be. Uh, but for example, if you're a person prone to anxiety, that you're just prone to getting really worked up over when you hear bad news and stuff, be wise about how much of that you consume in a day. Don't go on Facebook for three hours looking at stuff because half of it isn't true. The other half, you're not sure if it's true. Absolutely. And we live in a world today where our media absolutely makes its living on hyping and amplifying things. We, we know that's true. So be wise about how much you consume uh, in terms of information during these days. And, and in fact, balance that out with things that build your spirit, like the Word of God, like a good book, um, like some journal time, some prayer time. Things like that. Um, you need to do that, ladies and gentlemen. And so if you, you, you have to know yourself during this time. And if you know you're prone to that, be careful. Be wise about how much you consume and where you consume it. Um, so that's a, a takeaway I'd throw out there. You guys can do one quick. Um, okay, I'll throw out another one. Thank you, Randy, for that. Um, I think uh, we all need to work at, at staying positive and not hiding not hiding those things that God put in us at salvation, actually unleashing things like love and kindness and hope and courage. In, uh, in his book by Philip Yancey, in a book called Vanishing Grace, he says, what happened to the good news, that we're supposed to spread the good news. Um, this uh, female executive, she went to a seminar, and the, the person putting on the seminar talked about how to unleash love actually in the marketplace, which is not a subject that most people will talk about. Uh, and she decided to take this this personal, and she had 13 people working under her. And that very week, she walked down the hallway of that, and she began to ask them about their lives. One man thought that he was being fired, and he was scared to death because this woman never showed up in his cubicle. She said, no, I just want to know who you are. And they found out that within... A couple months after that, the company, which was actually in a dive, began to actually take an upswing, and they were actually working in the black now, and her executive said, I don't know what you're doing, but whatever you're doing, we need to teach this to the whole company, and all it was was just using the gifts that she had uh, with the people that normally she would have just been anonymous to. She took a risk in love, and love takes a risk. That's beautiful. That's good. So yep. take a risk. That's, How about you, Tim? That's mine. Yeah, I guess my, my takeaway from this is, is a hope that, you know, when we're all back walking through the halls and hugging everybody and shaking hands again, is that on that first week back when everything kind of comes back to normal, I have 30 people walking me and say, hey, Tim, I've got an idea for ministry I want to start. That's awesome. You know, take this time now. You got the time. You're at home. Think about what is your your gift, your talent, your thing that you just like doing, and how can I mold that into a thing that maybe gets two other people to do it with me, and we can start another ministry here at Inspire. Because Inspire, that's how we do it. Somebody will say, hey, Tim, when are we going to start this ministry? I'll say, great. When can you start it? And we'll support you with it. And we've always been the group, too, that says, Hey, we'll start a ministry if it doesn't work. Okay, we tried. No big deal. Try again. Right. Nobody's going to get mad at yep. a ministry that, that goes away after a year because for a year it was fantastic. Yep. So I guess that's my takeaway is spend this time, figure out, man, how can I come back and really take Inspire into the black in terms of ministry of, 
hey, here's a no idea. Here's all these new ministries that come out of this that we discovered doing in this solitude time. Let's close with a couple paragraphs from the book. Uh, Residing deep within the mysteries of God's judgment are the seeds of new life. And this, my friends, is cause for great encouragement. Like Noah, we often seek the false safety of anonymity. We repeat the time-tested mantras back to ourselves. It's not my business. Don't get involved. Just blend in. Who am I to make a difference? And we hide beneath them like Linus Van Pelt's security blanket and peanuts. (laughs) Don't get me wrong. We see the problems around us and want things to change. We just don't want to make a scene. But at some point, the problem of anonymity will rear its head. You You won't even be trying to make a scene. But like Noah, the light of your faithful, quiet faithfulness to God will begin to irritate the surrounding darkness. Maybe you'll refuse to ignore that homeless person. Maybe you will help the woman being beaten by her husband. Maybe you will counsel a young girl not to abort her baby. Maybe you'll stay faithful when confronted with temptation. Maybe in a world swirling with vengeance, you will choose forgiveness. Maybe you'll invite somebody to watch your church's live cast worship service. Whatever it is. All of these things risk putting your anonymity in danger. Following Jesus and preserving your anonymity at some point will simply be unable to coexist. Your faith will slowly emerge like an ark from the surrounding waters as a witness to God's goodness and a warning to all who oppose it. Take heart. The end of your anonymity will be the beginning of a more exciting and meaningful role in God's story. There might be some lightning. You might hear some thunder. You'll likely get wet. You should anticipate resistance, but God will not abandon you in the heart of the storm. In C.S. Lewis's classic book, The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, Lucy asks Mr. Beaver whether Aslan the Lion is safe. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Hmm. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. You don't need anonymity and its false sense of safety. Your shelter, your ark, is and always will be God himself. Remember, he's good, and he's the king. Oh, so rich, so rich. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow on our next podcast. We look at Chapter 4. We hope that you will sincerely explore how not to be anonymous during this time. And I'm coming out, out of anonymity just to say, we love you. Not afraid to say it. God bless you. See you, everybody.